ban coalition building. I noticed that, that, that many of the Sandinistas were Marxists, but they built coalition with grassroots Catholics. Yes, they got the priests and everyone alone. And then when they took power, they returned the process to voting, and people did not vote the, their party in, remember? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, they only they could vote. Right, they voted for a party that would not continue that kind of revolutionary change, but a change that would what they perceived of as a kind of normalcy, right? Yes, they went right for the normalcy and it kind of backfired yeah, it with everything that happened. And that's another thing, is that education is the key part of any social movement, I feel. Because that's how you got it. The Senate says you got it, they got him with education. They got him because the main revolutionary, the guy with the leader, the charisma, was an educator. In Canada, just recently, Jack Layden, he basically radicalized the entire left and he educated so many people. And Sadly, he died of cancer before anything could happen. But people were saying that in two years, Jack Layden probably would have shifted the entire Canadian political system to the far left. So that's how. Democratic how Party. Um, what, when we were working against the war in Vietnam, we tried to figure out what the war was about. That was a hard job to understand the war. Right, right now, we have a job. The job is to understand the actual power in this country. Yes. And, 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 and what is the structure? Where does Monsanto fit into the agriculture department? Or Walmart, Walmart handling GMO corn? I mean, these, these things, these things have, have, are, are part of the organizing job. And I swear, it's going to take the rest of our lives. I'm going to be dead in 30, a mere 30 years. <laughs> you, some of you will be going for 60 or 40. 70 years, yes. Cool. Um, well, I think that I agree very strong with the idea that organizing is this long, slow, very strenuous process that involves building relationships. Um, but I guess I'm concerned that at the current rate of destruction of really of our, our world, there's not going to be anything left right. um, if we just knock on doors and if we sort of go at this gradual rate. Um, and so I guess in that vein, um, I'm curious on the one hand about uh, if you draw a distinction between violence and property damage, or sort of like how violence is conceived. Um, so what I mean by that, I'm sort of thinking of yeah. the Liberation Front, Earth First, yeah. sort of notion that sometimes, um, well, that they define violence as being the harm to a living organism or a living ecosystem, um, as opposed to property damage, which is the dismantling of uh, inanimate matter. Um, let's, say, so, let's say Monsanto has a distribution Right. Center. And, and, and somebody comes along and, and messes it up in some way. That's what you call property damage. And do you think that's maybe could be a good idea? I guess I'm thinking, all right, in um, uh, mountain top removal coal mining in Appalachia, which I think you can definitely make the colonial analogy yes. for Appalachia yes. in the United yes. States. Yes. Um, but I think there, mountains are being destroyed. That's a resource that's, that's gone forever if it happens. Yes. So if there's some way to prevent that from happening, I would argue that that's ultimately an act against violence. Um, but of course, I think something that's sort of been skirting around here is this really effective repressive state apparatus, which has been built up um, based upon the Palmer raids, going through the COINTELPRO, uh, into now sort of the most recent legal instantiation in the National Defense Authorization Act, which prevents um, really any ability to, I think, be effective against the state apparatus in part because the executive office reserves the right uh, to declare someone a terrorist and assassinate them. Eric Holder was arguing that um, just a couple days ago. So that there, I guess, what, what I'm really concerned about is the way in which um, if, we, if we operate in ways that are the sort of accepted channels of organizing, um, whereas I think that great change can be accomplished through that, I think the women's movement is a really good example, that then people in Afghanistan will continue to be killed by drones and will continue to die. I, guess, I think Afghanistan is a huge thing we talk about. Um, so that then, like, the mountains will be destroyed, our, our water supply will be ruined, um, and our sort of global carbon commons are destroyed. So then against that, I think maybe we could talk about what it could mean to try and do more radical organizing. But I think if we do do that, then we keep running up against a state apparatus. So then... Okay, this is cool. This is cool. Because you put your finger on, on the question of what is effective. You use that term, what is effective, right? 
And I have a simple answer, which is a mass movement. That's our goal. In all cases, it's a mass movement. That is the power that we could potentially have. In 2008, we had a mass movement to get rid of an idiot president and put in a smart president who, who gave us a little bit of hope. That was a mass movement. It lasted a short amount of time, and the power wasn't there. But the women's movement, on the other hand, is, a, is and was a mass movement. The anti-war movement was a mass movement. The civil rights movement were mass movements. Mass movement is our goal. So then the question is, you said we don't have time, right? Well, the question is, what's most effective toward building a mass movement? Off of that question, I come up with the solution that anything that is tainted by the word or concept of violence is ineffective in this country toward building a mass movement. Because what it does is it takes the perpetrators and puts them outside of what's acceptable. Um, uh, in, in my case, people felt that we were either criminals or mentally ill. And, I, and, 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 and that, that's the only two categories that there are, criminal and mentally ill, for violence which is not sanctioned by the state. The state has a monopoly on violence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So the question, in our case, the Weathermen and the Black Panther, neither the Weathermen nor the Black Panther Party taking up guns or bombs or whatever had any effect on building a mass movement. So the Black Panthers may be a little bit more than Weathermen, but in the end they got smashed. And so what violence does is it, 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 it plays into the hands of the power to, to isolate the movement from its potential supporters. The question then that you raised was what about property violence? That's not violence against people. I actually think that stopping the removal of uh, a mountaintop by any means necessary would probably be, a, in the, on the whole, a good thing for the planet. You know? But does it help build a mass movement? And I think no. So I've come to the conclusion that violence, I, I, I call violence, even in a violent system, like the system that destroys the resources, the, the earth, this system that we have, even in a violent system, crimes against property or property violence, it does not help build a mass movement. If you can show me cases in which it does help move, build a mass movement, maybe. But I don't see it. Now, the Weather Underground, one of the, the, you'll be next, one of the twists of the Weather Underground history was that we decided at a certain point not to attack any people, but to only attack property. Mm -hmm. This was after the, the townhouse that I described. And we actually were successful at that, oddly enough. You know? But it didn't help build the movement attacking the property. And, uh, so the question is, what helps the mass movement? I define as violence, anything that the society calls violence is violence. In 1999, a few kids broke some windows of Starbucks yeah. and Nike and in, in, in Seattle. And that gave rise to an enormous hysteria, including millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that went into fighting domestic terrorism in the form of arming the police. And so that little bit of violence was the justification for a huge war. The, the animal rights movement, very early on, organizations, corporations that use animals, were attacked, you know, uh, um, chimpanzee or uh, uh, um, animals that are used for experimentation were set free and things like this, right? Well, they had enough power to pass a law in the Congress, and this will freak you out, it freaked me out. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, A-E-T-A. Right. right now, there are six people in 
federal prison for advocating an economic boycott of a company that experiment, a corporation that experimented with animals. In other words, a secondary boycott. The, the um, um, companies like Miss Claire or, or whatever that, that dealt with this other experimenting corporation, there would be a consumer boycott. Five or six people are, it's called the Huntington Lab Six, are in prison now for using computers to advocate an economic boycott. They were convicted under something called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Their strategy was a standard nonviolent strategy, which was boycott. It's been used by the labor movement, it's used by the women's movement, the gay rights movement, everybody uses boycott. Boycott is nonviolent. But, but things have built to the extent now that the animal industry, uh, if anybody does $10,000 or more economic damage or proposes $10,000 of economic damage to an enterprise dealing with animals, they go to prison. My argument is this. Our movement has to be 110 a thousand percent nonviolent, completely. The other side is violent. We have to advocate no violence, nothing against property, nothing, no verbal violence, no calling anybody pigs, no blowing up mountaintops, just one thing, nonviolence. Um, I wanted to go back to the Black Panther and some of that stuff, and I think it kind of joins it all together. But what I was thinking is, you know, it's like, when the Black Panther movement first went into getting guns, the reason they were getting guns is because they were being killed. And what they first did in my reading and understanding of it was that they didn't actually arm themselves to protect. They armed themselves so that they could witness the arrest of black people. They surrounded the arrests with armed people and then witnessed it, making it so that the police could not use as much violence without having witnesses. Today, we have replaced those weapons with live stream media. Yes. Live stream media. Because now, right now, I mean, like when I was in my first riot at 13, nobody ever wrote anything in any newspaper or on any television channel that that even happened. I mean, only the people that were there even knew it happened and, you know, how that works. So nothing was changed. But today, a woman gets pepper sprayed in New York and people from Hong Kong and around the world are calling the, the New York Police Department within 15 or 20 minutes because they saw it live. That is our new weapon. That is the weapon that's going to change from guns to peace. Um, I just would like to question a little bit your use or your talking about uh, property destruction because like so uh -huh. Property destruction, going back to that conversation. So I come, my grandfather was involved in draft board raids during Vietnam, burning draft cards. Yes. And uh, he was a part of the Canada 28. And they went on trial and they were ultimately acquitted of, uh, they were acquitted of the charges. And um, I think that that is a really uh, powerful example of how property destruction can start a conversation. Government and, property, draft files, right. great. And then it turns into this massive, it had a really long trial, basically yes. putting the Vietnam War on trial. Yes. And it started a conversation in a way that wouldn't have happened if we were just standing, you know, knocking on doors or holding a banner. And I think that, like, my, my dad did an action right before the, or right uh, before Shock and Off started, before the invasion of Iraq started. And it was the same thing. It was they were at a military recruiting station, but a lot of people got pissed off at, in our town and from Ithaca, New York. And it was a huge, it was like a very, very galvanizing kind of thing. And a lot of people were angry, but it also started a conversation. It was, you know, like I, I fully like or agree with violence against people is really not productive in any in any way, and isn't you know furthering cause of social justice. But I think that in, in terms of property damage, a symbol. I mean, symbolic or not, whatever, different kinds of property damage I think can be like a catalyst to start a conversation and to start an education of a community and make people talk about something and make people take a stand 